Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from howtodrawcomics.net and in today's video I'll be giving you another sneak peek into my new superheroines course. The lesson you're about to watch here will show you how to ink a full female comic book character from start to finish. You'll learn how to apply line weights to define their outline with slick, sharp-looking contours. I'll also share my best cross-hatching techniques for rendering realistic forms and materials. And we'll discuss pen settings and control so that you can get the lines you want. All the techniques you're about to learn in this video are the very same techniques I use on a daily basis to ink my work. I'm sharing this lesson with you in full, so if you enjoy it and you find the information you're about to learn here useful, wait until the end of this video to see what the full course has to offer. And if you can't wait till then, there will be a link in the description below so you can check it out right away. Alright, that's it. Enjoy. With their draft designs now complete, we're ready to ink up our superheroines. Since this stage is all about polishing off the final line art, we'll need to work in a little closer to capture the finer details here. So, starting with Zing, I've zoomed in 25% to begin inking over the top of her facial features. My go-to tool for inking in Manga Studio is of course the ever-trusty G-Pen, which is found just above the pencil button in the toolbar to the left of the canvas. Alternatively, you can also hit the P shortcut on your keyboard to toggle between the two. And if you'd like to change the pen settings, you can do so by hitting the second set of double arrows at the top of the neighboring column to expand it. But Manga Studio's tools are very intuitive and calibrated specifically to make the digital illustration experience feel as authentic as possible. Possible. So personally, I don't even bother adjusting the default settings. The pen tool can take some getting used to, since its output behaves slightly differently to the pencil tool when applying the same amount of pressure. So first and foremost, you'll have to figure out how hard you need to press and what size your brush will need to be at in order to capture the right kind of line. Some artists naturally hold their stylus tight and press down hard against the tablet as they draw. I'm one of those people, so I know that I'm going to have to use a smaller brush size to account for the added pressure I habitually apply when inking. Others have a lighter grip that glides across the tablet with a minimal amount of friction. If that's you, then you maybe want to scale up the size of your brush instead to get a heavier line. It all comes down to the final aesthetics you want your inked line art to have. Decide on that first, then adjust the settings accordingly. That also might mean just doing a few practice runs on the page first so that you can calibrate the way you work. Ok, so that takes care of the tools and settings, but let's talk about the inking process itself. I like to break it down into three specific stages, and stage one, which is what you're seeing happen in front of you right now, is the inked outline. This step is all about capturing the primary shapes and forms of the drawing, defining them with carefully weighted, slick, sharp and exceptionally clean energetic line work. Phase 2 is where we black in the shadows, which is what I've prematurely started doing here with her hair. Usually I'd wait until the entire character was outlined first, but I got carried away and wanted to see how her brunette locks would look once they were filled in with ink. Still, notice how the outline of her hair was defined in its entirety first. If you can keep the process organized, its execution runs a whole lot smoother. And hey, while we're here, let's talk for a moment about how the darker tone of her hair is immediately suggested by the increased amount of shadow we're dropping in now. As the light casts down from the top left, a gradual gradient begins to form as the highlights fall off into shadow, splitting the hair up into smaller clumps that are eventually dissolved by the solid blacks. This does achieve a darker shade for her hair, but it also adds more lift and texture to the layering and gives it an added amount of overall depth and volume. But as I said before, we're really jumping the gun here, so let's get back to stage 3 of the inking process, which is of course rendering and details. This is the final step, but it's also the most tempting to skip straight to because, let's face it, details are super fun. That's why there's a certain amount of discipline required here. The three-step inking formula is the best method I've come up with for producing an inked illustration with minimal hiccups along the way. It's straightforward and helps keep the process manageable. In fact, I like to treat each stage is a milestone. For example, I might ink the outline of the character in the first half of the day, take a short break for lunch, then wrap up the shadows and details in the second half. So then, rather than guessing how much progress I'm able to make, I've got particular points I'm aiming to reach by a certain time. 
That clears up the ambiguity of my production pipeline and helps me stay on track, because it's too easy to get lost in the process, and although that can be a good thing sometimes, it gets difficult to keep things in perspective if you're not paying attention to where you're at. So remember the three shape categories we learned about last lesson? Well, when it comes to inking, I tend to define the outline for the largest ones first, like the bust armor I'm working on here for Zing, then I articulate the medium elements and surface details within them. This allows me to work on one section of the character at a time, completing their outline bit by bit. I use a slightly thicker outline for the major shapes first, to ensure they're visually distinct from the rest of the design. Each section must be contoured with a prominent edge that vividly describes its silhouette, because besides encompassing the sub-shapes and details within it, this bounding line holds the fundamental form of every component that makes up the character. The secondary surface details, such as the rectangular embossments around the base ridge of the chest plate, are then defined inside it with a slightly finer outline. This produces a visual hierarchy which shows us that the smaller elements are part of the greater whole, rather than being separated out on their own. Even going so far as to partially break the outline of the subshapes in the areas of the major form that are most facing toward the light gives the impression that they're built into the armor's surface. Same deal with her arm, we delineated its overall shape first, and now we're laying in the interior design elements. Notice how, by keeping the contours sharp and energetic, we're able to delineate these shapes with a sense of solidarity. If I can, I try to draw out each line with a single, continuous stroke, by steadily sliding sliding my hand across the tablet. Short contours that don't have far to travel, or end at a corner to change trajectory, can be dropped in with a swift dash. Longer lines tend to be a bit more troublesome however, since there's a greater chance they'll run off track or get wobbly toward the end of their run. In that case, I'll hit the undo button and attempt the line again, something you can see me doing repeatedly throughout this demonstration. Or if I think the line can be saved, I'll ink back over the top and gently reroute it along the correct path. Some contours stretch on for such a long distance that you'll have no choice but to build up the line with multiple strokes until it's reached the desired length. This is also a great way to sculpt the outline for the shapes you're working with. The long sleek contours that define the outline of her legs are a great example of this, what I like to call line smithing in action. There are even occasions where I'll use the eraser tool to further shape the lines or chisel out a better path for them to follow, if I'm really being a perfectionist. In fact, the selected shortcuts I'm routinely switching between on my keyboard are the P key for the pen tool, E for the eraser, and the bracket keys to resize either of them on the fly as I work. That limited toolset is all that's needed to craft each line you're seeing me trace around Zing here. Watch how the contours glide down the length of her leg, encompassing its shape with this smooth fluidity. As the outer curves of the upper thigh dip in at the knee, then out again around the calves of the lower leg, we can see a rhythmic wave-like pattern begin to form. This makes the anatomy feel structurally seamless, as one line flows into the next, effortlessly describing the forms of her muscle structure along the way. That streamlined elegance is a uniquely feminine characteristic, and nowhere will it be more prominent than in the gorgeous gams of your comic book gals. Long, graceful legs have long been a staple of feminine beauty, often emphasized to catch the eye as the figure transitions from one pose to the next. This is partly because they make up at least half of the character's overall gesture, which is likely why when we see a ballerina, dancer, or figure skater performing, for example, their legs are often accentuated with tight, fitting material to complement the form. Every bump, corner, curve, and edge you ink in presents an opportunity to clarify that particular part of the character you're molding, and you want to seize it with every stroke because this is the final rendition of their line art. It's more important than ever to define the silhouette of each component with clean-cut precision that'll ultimately give the finished concept a near perfect read. And of course, that takes time, so don't pressure yourself into becoming some kind of inking wizard that can lay down slick-looking line art without ever lifting your pen up off the page. You can make mistakes, and if you're working digitally, they're easily fixed. What matters is the end result, so let it take as long as it needs to. If you're worried about speed, you'll inevitably get faster as you take the time to practice your technique in the right way. Every skill requires a period of time to develop your approach, method, and technique. And sometimes you don't even realize the kind of outcome you're striving for in the beginning. Even style takes time to fully mature. So don't rush it, 
Give yourself the time you need to integrate your learning, and soon enough, it'll become second nature. Along with the raised rectangular embossments around her inner thighs and knee pads, I've also subtly suggested the underlying muscle groups within the interior of the leg silhouette. Although Zing is somewhat of a toned character, her anatomy is really only hinted at here with one, maybe two doubled up lines placed on the darkest side of the muscles facing furthest from the light. For female characters, the less detail you place in around lighter coloured or exposed areas of the body, the better. Usually, the outline alone will be enough to define them adequately, with the exception of a minimal amount of rendering to subtly describe the major forms of her anatomy if needed, such as in this case. But going too far will result in an increasingly aged, masculine looking figure that does take away from her feminine appeal. What you can see me doing now is I'm outlining the shadows along the front of Zing's body, where her costume divides off into a darker material. I do this so that I can define a strong shape for them first, before filling in the blacks, and you can see that I'm making an effort to add character to the contours to avoid any shapes that might appear boring or uninteresting to look at. That doesn't just apply here either, every line I've inked in describes the shape of the character's anatomy, hairstyle and costume assets in a way that almost seems to exaggerate the form they're defining. And we want to do that as much as possible because shape leaves the greatest amount of visual impact out of everything else in an illustration. We've all seen those underwhelming pieces of comic book art where the character's arms and legs look like a string of sausages, or where the muscles look like they were drawn onto the body of the character with a felt tip pen. The proportions might check out, and maybe they're striking a powerful pose, but without a strong sense of form and shape to boot, the end result will be so uncompelling that the character just looks like they're wearing a bad Halloween costume. It will take time to figure out how best to depict the various aspects of your superheroines as line art, because we all translate our ideas differently. But if you want them to look convincing, keep each contour as descriptive of the form as possible. Consider how one line leads into the next, the way it angles, where it kinks and curves, and its length before breaking off into a new direction. Use those line attributes to generate a stylized interpretation of your character that best represents them. Zing's wings are probably one of the most difficult parts of her design to ink, since the lines defining them run along a lengthy vertical curve that stretches out for quite a distance. This is where I need to work carefully, keeping my grip firm and hand steady as the line is drawn out along its path. I want to keep it as smooth as possible, avoiding any waviness. It's also important that the direction the line is travelling in runs seamlessly along the length of the wing, without any bumps or odd turns along the way. The same applies to her super-powered hula hoops. Their circumference is made of two inner and outer curved contours that create a complete loop where they're joined at the top and bottom of the hoop. If we were to break this circuit and straighten them out, these contours would be even longer than the length of her wings, and they're trickier to ink since the curved trajectory of the lines that form either side of the hoop must abide to the symmetry of its shape. If it doesn't, this could cause the interior and exterior rings to appear warped. These instances require a masterful amount of physical control over your hand, which can take years of practice to truly harness. And as you can see, I'm making more than a few attempts to get these lines neatly drawn out, usually having to use multiple strokes to complete them. Of course, there's tools in Mega Studio and pretty much every other digital drawing application out there that would automate this process for me with minimal error. And even working traditionally, you could also use stencils or a compass to guide the panel quill. So why don't I? Well, there's a few reasons, but first and foremost, I feel like a finish that's too perfect lacks the natural flaws and blemishes an artist would otherwise leave on their work, and thus it loses the genuine hallmarks of traditional craftsmanship. There is a point where the line work can be so clean cut that it comes across as inauthentic, as if it was created by a machine, and although it might have been created using a computer, case in point, it shouldn't look like it was. Even when it comes to traditional drafting tools and templates that study the line for you, the illustration tends to lose its organic feel if they're overused. Personally though, I like to challenge myself. I might struggle along the way and take twice as long to ink an image, but that which you practice most, you'll get better at. And if I depended on drawing aids to do the work for me, those lessons wouldn't even show up on my radar, and I'd be even more handicapped when it came to working freehand.
Okay, so now I'm going in and filling the shadows I outlined before with black on a new layer called Shadow Fill and using a slightly larger brush size for the G Pen. The proper term for this process, I believe, is spotting the blacks, and it's fairly straightforward. All you've got to do is keep inside the lines. You can see how this particular portion of Zing's costume instantly starts to look darker in contrast to the rest, which is the exact effect we're looking for here. As a result, her design is much easier to take in. The different sections of her costume are more distinct. We see it and we get it without having to decipher what it is we're looking at. Notice how the blacked out areas of shadow reach your eye first. We know this is because of the stark contrasting effect created against the lighter colored areas, but when the figure is in motion, this creates a series of dynamic focal points that'll enhance the readability of any panel Zing features in. Combined with the way she's framed, it becomes much easier to direct the reader's focus, which is handy in comics since we want the visual narrative to flow with as little friction as possible. The darker values also give her added depth, weight and presence on the page. She draws attention to herself by design. This contrasting effect isn't exclusive to black and white values. It can also apply to opposing textures, materials, shapes and colors. So try to integrate at least some contrast into your superheroine design to help break it up a bit and make them more readable. Up until this point, I haven't been putting a whole lot of thought into the weighting of Zing's outline, and that's what this stage is all about. To put it simply, line weighting refers to the variation of thickness and density within a line, and it can be used strategically to enhance the visual appeal of the finished line art, draw attention to areas of importance within the illustration, create depth, and imply lighting direction, all within the contours of the drawing alone. Some inkers will apply line weights habitually, and even I've done that to some degree just through the gesture of my strokes, but I prefer to treat the line weighting process as a separate pass, even if it's not as time efficient as dropping them in on the fly. Once the entire character is contoured, it becomes much clearer to me where the line weights are going to have the most impact. I've dropped back down to the inks outline layer below the shadow fill layer to apply the line weights, retracing over the contours I previously laid down and adjusting the pressure I'm applying in accordance with the increased thickness I'd like to give each line. The way I generally go about it is any lines that contour the side of a form facing away from the light, such as the underside of her headpiece, shoulder pads and chest armor, get thickened up to indicate the direction of the light source. This gives the character an implied sense of form and solidarity, despite the absence of rendering and details that would otherwise help to describe it. In the lightest areas of the form, the defining contours are kept thin, and in some cases, they're even broken to intensify the suggested brightness of the light source. If done with consistency, the line weight variation creates what you can essentially think of as an optical illusion, where we simply assume the character is being presented under some kind of lighting condition, when the only thing to indicate that is a simple shift in the thickness of the line work. We can also thicken up the outline for areas of the character that we want to emphasize or make pop off the page further. These are usually going to be key points of focus that stand out against the rest of the image. This is especially useful for creating distance between any overlapping elements within the illustration. For example, I want Zing's body to stand out against her wings, so I've made the outside contours of her arms and body heavier. If you're using line weights for this reason, think of it as a layering process. The areas of the image that you want to have fall back will get the lightest outline, whereas those that are most prominent are brought forward with the darkest. Everything in between is scaled accordingly. The reason this works is heavier lines catch our eye before the lighter ones do, which is why they appear closer. Again, what we're essentially creating here is another optical illusion that tricks the depth perception of the eye. Best of all though, weight variation just makes your line art look less flat, more dynamic and visually appealing. So I try to make sure almost every contour that delineates Zing here has some differentiation in thickness. This process doesn't always mean adding more weight to the predefined line work. Sometimes you want to trim it down with the eraser tool instead to create a finer contour. In this sense, you're sculpting the line to finesse its shape, ironing out the bumps and grooves, dialing the thickness back and forth to reach an ideal density. Each contour should be smooth and clean, defining every aspect of the character with sharp solidarity. 
This is the final line art that'll represent our superheroine, so it's worth going the extra mile to give her the best presentation possible. I'm very meticulous when it comes to the line smithing of my characters, and it does show in the end, but there's no secret behind it, just a little extra polish, patience, and time spent. It's all about attention to detail, becoming more conscious and observant of the lines you're laying down onto the page, looking at the drawing in front of you on a deeper level and asking yourself, what more can I do to show the true intent of my vision, then committing to that regardless of the tweaks or fixes you'll have to make to get it looking just right. That might mean spending an extra hour or two at the drawing board, but nothing makes an artist feel more proud than knowing they went all the way. Alright, now we've made it to the rendering stage, and I'm inking in the first pass of hatches on a new layer above the ink's outline layer and shadow fill layer. These ultra-fine render lines are some of the most intricate I've inked in thus far, and are managing to do so with an extremely small brush size and a very steady hand. Each hatch is pulled out of the shadow along the length of the form it's travelling across. As they emerge, the lines transition from the heaviest weight at the base, then gradually become thinner as they taper off in intensity toward the light. Each one runs parallel to its neighbour, the space between them and their heaviness determined by the density of the tone I'm trying to create. And along the front of Zing's torso, what I am attempting to create is a mid-tone that'll blend the pitch black shadows into the highlights, resulting in a smooth gradient that also helps to describe the dimensions of her body with a greater amount of depth. To pull this off convincingly, I've got to make sure the trajectory of each render line follows the shape of her anatomy closely, so every hatch conforms to a slight curve as it travels around the form. None of these lines should be dead straight unless the surface being rendered is completely flat. The length of the render lines control the fall off of their light to dark gradient, which often depends on how rigid or round the form's geometry is. Zing's belly, for example, is soft with no hard edges, so the hatches drawn along it are longer to create a gradual blend between the light and dark values. The bottom ridge of her rib cage has a more prominent edge, however, resulting in a harder tonal transition. Gradients can also be affected by the spacing between each render line. If we look at the hatches running against the shadows of her inner thigh, for example, we can see how they very subtly start to spread further apart, lifting the tonal value of the shading as it transitions into the brightest areas of the form. The lines also become less thick and intense, and even begin breaking up as the dimmed tones completely decay into the highlights. So the characteristics of these hatches, the thickness of the lines, their spacing and length, are really the key to controlling the contrast, tone, and spread of the light to dark gradients rendered around each form. Of course, just as dark materials are typically given a greater amount of shadow, they also require additional rendering to reflect their lower values. So while we'll see an abundance of intricate crosshatching around the darker coloured portions of Zing's suit and hairdo, everything else will be left relatively untouched in comparison, besides a few cast shadows and texture details. Speaking of cast shadows, I'm dropping some in now around the top of her wings. Like any other shadow, their shape is outlined first with a thin contour. But it's not completely filled in with black this time around, since that'd be too intense for the material they're being cast over here. Instead, the interior of the shadow is rendered using a series of hatches to create a darkened shade, but not one that's pitch black. In this case, all of the hatches are evenly spaced and weighted to level out the tone, although there are situations when you might want to gradually distance them to produce a light to dark gradient, but that all depends on the lighting setup. The way you determine the darkness of the tone is to simply consider the brightness of the set. In a dimly lit environment, every tone will be darker than if they were under a more intense light source. The size of each cast shadow is decided upon based on the mass of the object projecting them and the direction of the light beam. A big form will cast a larger shadow than a small one, but depending on how the light is positioned, the shadow could distort and stretch for a longer distance that would cover more area. Cast shadows are great for visually conveying depth and dimension in your character because they imply that one form is projecting its shadow over another. This gives the figure an added sense of three-dimensionality because there's now another element at play which shows us that her forms are solid, not only catching light, but also blocking it. 
Next I'm rendering in a lighter shade along the underside of her wings. This is a great example of how different tonal intensities can be controlled through the thickness of the render lines and their spacing. Nearly the entire underside of her wing will be overlaid with hatches, but notice how the cast shadow at the top of the wing is still distinctly more intense than the softer value we're shading in now. In theory, the entire character could be crosshatched from head to toe to blanket them in varying degrees of tone, and if you look at master inkers such as Bernie Wrightson, many of their illustrations are rendered to such a degree. I don't personally, for stylistic reasons, not to mention time and physical exertion, but my point here is that there's an entire range of values that can be achieved by modifying the attributes of your render lines. To get the balance right, you've got to have a solid understanding of how different materials and colors translate to grayscale value under the lighting conditions of the set you staged your superheroine in. Because what all of this depends on is a clear visual hierarchy of tone from dark to light, and conveying it through crosshatching is something you can really only familiarize yourself with through practice and experimentation. It's all relative too, meaning that we're looking at the contrast of one tone against another. They could become bright or darker depending on the dynamics of the light source, but the distinction between them should still remain the same. That wraps up the first pass of rendering, now we're ready to overlay the cross hatches. I've created a new layer for them just to be safe, because the last thing we want to do is ruin the intricate hatching I've already done. This second layer of render lines will run in a 90 degree perpendicular direction to the previous ones, forming a mesh grid as they pass over the top. Their thickness, quantity and density still control how the character is shaded, except now we're able to create more contrast in the gradients, produce a smoother blend between the values and intensify the darkness of the tones. This results in us being able to further emphasize the forms of her anatomy and really create a sense of volume. You can see now how these cross hatches are wrapping around the surface of Zing's body on a new axis. If the previous layer of rendering flows in a vertical direction, this one travels horizontally and vice versa. Remember, the purpose of rendering isn't just to light the forms of a character, it's also there to help describe the dimensions of their surface, and the second layer of crosshatches cause them to pop off of the page even more, which is what every aspect of your illustration should be designed to do, lift your character off of the page. That's what makes them instantly captivating. But that doesn't mean we want to go all gung-ho with our crosshatches here, we don't want to place them everywhere. I've learned to reserve the second layer of rendering only for the darker materials throughout the character, since the double up of lines significantly drops their tone to a darker value. Knowing where to place just the right amount of rendering is key to avoiding a character that's overpowered with too much detail, especially when it comes to superheroines. If anything, you want to hold yourself back. That's when you know you've got a real handle on the rendering process, when you're aware of how much it can enhance your work, yet use it sparingly. It's like seasoning a meal with salt and pepper, just the right amount will enrich the flavours of the meal in your mouth, but pop off the top of the shaker and pour it on, and it'll become unbearable to eat. Now I'm rendering Zing's hair, ensuring each hatch follows the shape and flow of its style. Since she's a brunette, I'm going to treat her hair as I would any other dark material, ramping up the number of render lines and laying them in nice and tight to keep the tone in those lower value ranges. Underlying layers of hair are pushed back into the dark recesses of her intertwining locks, and those atop are lifted out in contrast to generate more volume. Texture is added as the larger clumps of hair that direct its movement are broken up into finer subdivisions, and I'm doing all of this in the context of the lighting scheme ensuring that the parts of her hairdo that fall into shadow are given the most amount of rendering, while those that are directly hit by the light get very little. And of course, that all helps to describe the form of its style. Luscious wavy hair is very gestural in nature, often depicted with a free-flowing weightlessness that's dynamically affected by the momentum of the character's movements and environment conditions such as wind and rain. It can be blown, pulled and positioned into almost any formation, which is why it's important that we try to preserve that liveliness as it's rendered, by ensuring that each hatch conforms to the trajectory of the hair's directional flow. A bulk of the rendering is done, the shadows have been filled in, and the main contours of the drawing have been sufficiently weighted. What's left to attend to now is the final details and tweaks that'll really polish off Zing's line work.
This final phase includes dropping in additional car shadows to give her some extra pop, such as the one I've just rendered in underneath her shoulder pad. I'm also adjusting the thickness of the line weights throughout her design, to better describe the shape of the contours and the forms they're delineating. The brightness of the tones in certain areas might need to be recalibrated to better balance the value range of the character overall as well. This could mean the addition of new cross hatches to increase the tonal density, or getting rid of the hatching altogether in some areas to lighten them up. The underside of Zing's wings was reading a little too flat for me, so I'm repositioning the hatches and adjusting their length to more accurately describe the rounded surface of the form. That ability to convey the dimensions of a form through the spacing, thickness, and length of these ultra-fine lines is the biggest hurdle when it comes to rendering. If you haven't had a lot of experience using this cross-hatching technique before, shade your superheroines the best you can for the assignment you've been given in this course. But then spend some time going back to the basics, try rendering a cube, sphere, or cylinder, and see if you can get those primitive forms to read accurately. If you're struggling with rendering now, you should see a noticeable improvement after doing those simple exercises. Because they're not just teaching you how to render basic shapes, you're actually gaining a better understanding of how form works, and that translates over directly into the more complex forms of your character's anatomy. This is a great refresher even for more experienced artists. Only a few weeks ago, I was drawing away in my sketchbook, shading the rippling muscles of a hot new character I was working on, when suddenly I realized the distribution of the crosshatches across their anatomy wasn't emphasizing the forms correctly. They seemed flat and uneven, and the level of detail was inconsistent in different areas. The core values didn't seem balanced either, the arms were a completely different skin tone to the rest of the body, and the face was just a congested mess of over overindulgent rendering. I don't know if I'd had some kind of mental lapse that day or I just wasn't paying attention. After all, it's easy to get lost in the details. Once you start hatching, it's hard to stop. But I was surprised that my usual level of discipline hadn't been there to keep everything in check that day. After a certain point, you'd like to think that you've practiced these things repetitively enough that you can trust your unconscious to take over and make the important decisions for you. But as I discovered, it's never a good idea to go complete autopilot. That's how you get caught off guard. There's a lot to remember when it comes to comic book illustration, and every new skill you learn is another ball you've got to juggle. First it's the basic principles such as shape, form and value, then perspective, proportions and anatomy, and after that the higher tier considerations such as design, composition and storytelling. And every time a new one gets added to the rotation, it's tricky to catch the balls and keep them spinning, at least at first. But then you learn that new skill, you wield it, and it becomes part of what makes your art even better than it was before. But if you get so confident that you no longer have your eye on the balls you're juggling, there's a chance you'll eventually drop one or two along the way. You'll catch the others and keep the rotation going, and when you realize you've lost a few, they'll inevitably get thrown back into the loop. But then you'll have to pay attention again, because more balls have been added to the cycle you've become accustomed to. They might have been there previously, and it may not be as hard as it once was to catch them, but you'll still need to carefully focus until you get used to juggling the extra balls balls again. Comic art is the same way, from penciling to inking and colouring. The entire workflow requires you to be aware of the components that go into your illustrations, and every now and then there will be a weak link in the chain that requires reinforcement. It's not like you learn everything once and that's it. Every skill that goes into this is like a muscle. You've got to exercise it regularly if you want to keep it strong. That's why you're best at what you practice most. If you draw pretty ladies all the time, you'll probably find men difficult to draw. If you practice heads and hands, but never legs or feet, you can guess which ones will be your greatest weakness. And if you want to be well-rounded at everything, you've got to learn how to lean into those weaknesses, finding the flaws in your work and conquering them as they arise. Treat every challenge you come up against as an opportunity to grow beyond it and get better. That's your compass. It's pointing you in the exact direction you need to go to take your art to the next level. Now I'm further refining Zing's face, adding in some subtle rendering around her eyes, thickening up the mascara, and finessing the shape of her brows and jawline. Too many additional details will blemish her clear, youthful complexion, so I'm staying away from defining her cheekbones and certainly any wrinkles. Instead, I'm emphasizing the facial features themselves, especially the eyes and lips, which exude the greatest amount of feminine allure. In fact, I thought it might be a cool idea to try on some black lipstick for Zing, just to see how that would look. 
but then I decided that'll probably be a little too much. Plus, it'd take away my ability to experiment with different shades of colour that I could potentially go with later. For me, the most important part of any character is their face, but this applies especially to superheroines. That's where they emanate their physical beauty at its most potent, and typically you'll want them to be attractive since that visual desirability is so closely tied to the archetype. If you think about villains, which are on the opposite end of the spectrum, they usually look scarier, more eccentric, and in some cases, downright hideous, which makes their physical appearance somewhat uncomfortable to look at. This is exactly what you want a villain to invoke, uneasiness, uncertainty, and fear. But a superheroine has a much more inviting appearance. She pulls in your attention and holds your gaze. She's an ideal, the encompassment of the divine beauty and power we all worship, if not dream of having ourselves. And although the physique of her body and the way she holds herself will play a vital role in conveying that, it's really her face that captures the eye of the beholder first. It creates an instant connection as the features express the unseen emotions and feelings within the character. You might not even notice the average looking extras in the background of a superhero comic book, and most villains are psychopaths, so even if you wanted to get an emotional read on them, you'd be out of luck. But an attractive superheroine who isn't just good looking, but symbolizes divine beauty, is going to entrance you instantly. That's really the key to opening up a reinforced emotional connection between you and that character. Especially when you're talking about superheroines whose features are often emphasized with makeup to specifically draw attention to the most expressive parts of their face. Visuals always come first, before the personality of your character. I'm saying looks matter, and although that statement might be a little controversial, the reality is aesthetics basically determine whether or not you even take the time of day to get to know someone, because the way they look gives you a clue into who they are before they ever speak a word. Which is important because, of course, we want to gauge whether or not someone is friendly, kind, mean, or dangerous before we approach them. And comics are a visual medium, so that applies to the way you convey your characters to an even greater extent. But then I guess you could say Zing here is so beautiful, so powerful, and so idealized that she's kind of intimidating. And I think that's definitely the effect you want your superheroines to have. It's like if you were to meet your favorite movie star. It'd be totally surreal, but so nerve-wracking at the same time. Imagine what it would be like to actually meet Wonder Woman, Zatanna, or Captain Marvel. Better yet, what if they came to your rescue? You'd be frozen with awe and rendered speechless. Now think about how you'd feel standing in the same room as the superheroine you've been creating throughout this course. Hopefully, they're so overwhelmingly awesome that they'd leave you and everyone else in their presence starstruck. Except for the evildoers. We want them trembling in their boots. With a few final tweaks to the contours that define the shape of her legs, that pretty much completes the inking process for Zing. What you've seen in this lesson is an approach to inking a superheroine clad in light armor, which is fitted over a classic tight-fitting costume consisting of two distinct materials. We learned about shape, form, line weight variation, shadow, and cross-hatching. In the following lessons, we'll explore methods for inking drapery, chromatic armor, and augmented robotics. Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from HowToDrawComics.net. If you've ever wanted to illustrate powerful comic book women but aren't sure where to begin, my new Superheroines course might be just what you're looking for. It'll show you the complete process for drawing, inking, and coloring female comic book characters from start to finish. The biggest challenge most of us run into right off the bat is establishing a strong foundation for our characters that'll ensure their success. So we'll begin by constructing a proportionally accurate figure with correctly placed anatomy that exudes feminine appeal, power, and personality. With a rock solid foundation established, you'll then learn how to develop a memorable design for your superheroines. I'll give you a practical approach to the design process that allows you to emphasize who your character is along with their backstory so that they're easily understood and relatable. But most importantly, you'll learn what it takes to make them look cool. And after that, we'll get stuck into the practical comic art techniques for inking and coloring as we refine the designs for our superheroines into a full-blown character concept.
You'll learn how to use line weights to make your line art pop, cross-hatching techniques for shading and describing form, and how to introduce contrast to your character's design by separating their values for increased visual interest. Then finally, I'll take you through my comic book coloring workflow. We'll discuss color theory, psychology, and lighting, and how they can be used in combination with one another to create an eye-catching presentation for your superheroines. I'll also highlight the distinct differences between material color, texture, and reflectivity so that you're able to incorporate an added level of visual interest within your designs. Throughout these lessons, I'll be demonstrating the development process for three unique superheroines from beginning to end. So wherever you're at in your journey as a comic book artist, you should see a significant improvement in your work after going through the lessons included within this course. When you get this course, you'll also receive the PSD files and digital art brushes used throughout the demonstration so that you can go through each layer for yourself and see exactly how these superheroines were composed. Best of all, you'll be able to go back and watch each lesson as many times as you like. You can play, pause and rewind them to review any information you might have missed the first time and go through the course content at your own pace. We've got a lot of ground to cover and I can't wait to show you what's in store. So buckle up, strap in and let's get started.